everyone and welcome to our architecture industry Q&A live stream as part of the art and design degree show. So this is our first one for the art and design degree show and I'd like to first start by introducing myself. I'm Karishma and I'm from the Faculty of Arts, Design and Humanities and I work in the events team and I will be your host for this live stream today. So firstly, thank you to our panel members and also thank you to all of you watching for joining us today. Uh, we're joined by some of our alumni and industry guests who will talk about their own experiences, their journey, what they're doing right now. And most importantly, we will be answering your questions towards the end of the live stream. So please leave us a comment or a question and we'll do our best in answering um, these um, towards the end of the live stream. So first, I'd like to start by introducing everybody on the panel. And we have Dav with us today, who's a partner at Glen Howard's Architect. We also have Chris with us today, who is a project director at Studio Downey Architect LLP. And we have Margaret with us, who's part two architectural assistant at Skidmore Owens Merrill. And we've got Laura, who's keeper at Warmer Yard. So there's our panel there for you today. And um, okay, so I think let's just dive straight in. So thank you again for everybody as you're joining us right now, or if you have been from a few minutes ago, let's go around the panel first and hear about their job, their job role, what they're doing right now, and just a little bit about themselves and the journey through their career. So let's start with Dav. Dav, would you like to take it away? Yes, thank you very much, Krishma. Um, as as, uh, as Krishma said, I'm a, I'm a partner at um, uh, Glen Howells Architects, and um, I studied my part one and part two, um, both my undergraduate and postgrad at uh, DMU, uh, before joining Glen Howells Architects in uh, summer 1999, and uh, and then I completed my professional part, my professional exams part three, during my early years at uh, at uh, GHA. Now, I guess just to start from my from my sort of early career and, and sort of journey through um, to where, where to what I do now it, it just maybe just a very quick sort of a, a sort of a, a summary of that um, I mean, when I left when I left um, uh, DMU in 1999 I think that time um, the the use of visualization and 3d modeling was was taking shape so I left with with 3d modeling and visualization skills uh, from the university and that gave me the opportunity that when I joined um, GHA, I was able to work on some design competitions and focus on presentations, which helped me de de develop my, my design skills and also helped me uh, develop my confidence in decision making. So this type of engagement and mentoring that I had really pushed my pace of working, my clarity in thinking and also making design decisions. It was the best start to my career now looking, looking, looking back. And, and I went to work. I went, I went on to work for a number of interesting projects, including the Rotunda in Birmingham, uh, which was which was my hometown, and also where GHA um, um, uh, Studios are based. It also helped me to be exposed to clients and explore ideas to clearly communicate my thinking and my thoughts. And that all helped me to get involved with even more exciting projects. So the company was growing, and my involvement not only was in the design of projects, but it also started to get involved with how um, the, the practice and the structure of it worked as well. So it really gave me a platform to progress my, my sort of long-term career at, at the GHA. I was then promoted from an architect to a project architect as I led on a delivery of the Rotunda and some projects, then onto an associate as I managed a small team to work on a number of commercial and residential projects um, across the UK and then began to build a small studio. So what I began to realize there was it was not just about exploring ideas and developing thoughts and, and sort of, but also motivating, inspiring and, and working with, with a team of, 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 of people with other different skills that could complement. So it was about finding your sort of role in this, in this studio and, and, and sort of, I guess, providing that, that sort of sense of leadership and, through that sort of um, early work, we were we won a number of competitions across the UK, and this this then sort of led me to being promoted to an associate director, where I was leading one of the five studios in our in our Birmingham in our Birmingham base, and then eventually onto a director as I began to oversee half of the office, 
as well as the clients, the projects, and the design. So as a, pro as a practice grew to over 100, um, where we were back in 2011, I was then promoted to, an, uh, to a partner um, where I oversaw all the projects and the design quality across the Birmingham studio. By this time, it also had a London studio, which had been going on for sort of 15 years as well. And so my, my role was very much to oversee the, the quality, the people development, uh, and the client relationships uh, to head, the, head, these, head these really important facets of a business in, in, our, in our Birmingham studio. And, you know, both how people work, how the quality of design that we deliver and the client relationships, these all work in hand in hand to not just generate future work, but also begin to look at profit and, and growth in the company as well. So I've, I've now been at uh, Glen Howells Architects for over 21 years. And for me, it is my family. And my role is now to help with planning the long-term future of this practice, of this very practice that actually shaped my future as a young graduate designer. So for, for, for our culture, I think being homegrown helps me to maintain that real strong ethos and that approach to our, to our design culture and, and how we evolve it for the next generation of creative talent. So that's, that's the role I play now in, uh, at, at GHA. Thank you. Thank you so much there, Dav. Uh, that's a great little kind of insight into kind of your journey where you started and having graduated from DMU because there'll be a lot of students watching us now who are either, you know, studying um, currently or looking to join us or have graduated. Um, so it's, it's great to see, you know, uh, someone who's kind of been there, done that and uh, from for all our panel members, actually, which, you know, we'll hear from. Just to remind everyone while you're watching us, if you have any questions that come up from, you know, from what you're listening to from our panel members at the moment, please do leave uh, your questions in the comments and we'll get round to it towards the end and answering them. Um, so we really do want you to take this opportunity um, in, in asking questions to the panel members. So thank you again, Dav. And let's, uh, well, let's go to Chris. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your journey, what you're doing right now and your experiences as well? Hi, Karishma. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I, I think a bit like Dav, I need to kind of, set the scene because when i i did my ba ons at uh, dmu and when i left from there i mean that, that was a time we were still using drawing boards and rotaring pens we were masters of the photocopy copiers at the time uh, i came out of a uh, study into the mid 90s recession at that time we didn't have the sort of size of student fees that the current students have i had a very small loan um Equally, I didn't have any money either. Uh, I, I would say I sent out more than 100 CVs. Um, but, you know, everything had to be posted. Um, I found some work packing books and magazines. It took me about nine months to finally get some interviews. And I had a, a sort of a, a purple patch of about six or seven and, and two or three job offers uh, in that time. So the uh, my first job was in... March 97 and and that job is the job I'm still at today so it's a it's a long homegrown uh career I've had if you like and I think what they liked about me was the fact that I had sort of worked in small businesses packing books magazines organizing the office that I ended up working in so it was a very uh, gradual uh introduction to the business and day one uh, I was working at tile layouts i think for an underground car park from memory we were producing general arrangement drawings I, i'd be allowed out to go and uh, visit sites uh, do surveys with the office camera at the time um and that, that really got us into the role of you know seeing the site getting the reality and, and, and bringing that back to the office and our observations and so on because I'd taken a long time to get my first job, I actually then deferred my re-entry into diploma. So I eventually stayed about a year and, and three months at the office, but made some time to go off traveling now that I had some money in my pocket. And I think that's really, really important is that you know when you do get the chance to go traveling, I, I took the chance at DMU to go on every um, school visit they did uh, during the Easter break. Um, I think it's really important to broaden your horizons as, as much as, as possible. So I then moved my diploma down to London, much more expensive living uh, in, in London. Uh, 
So whilst I was a full-time student at the university uh, in Westminster, I would work part-time at Studio Downey. So I kept there for a couple of days a week, and I'd balance that with my full-term, full-time coursework. Uh, and it, it, it really worked okay, actually, I have to say, uh, both in terms of the, the work I could do for the office and also what I could do for my uh, college work. What that meant at the office was, uh, you know, in light of current COVID times, we've got a lot of part-time working and furloughed staff. Is I was working on the smaller packages and, and working on toilets and illustrating planning schemes. So whilst I wouldn't necessarily be involved in the full general arrangement development or the elevational design, I'd be looking at the illustrations only. And that really brought me into the design process. I came out of uh, part two, entered into um, part three effectively, uh, which is really beginning at Root Design. So I stayed at Westminster. I stayed at the office at Studio Downey. Uh, I was now a site architect because I got a track record with the office already of kind of the experience of how they were producing the drawings, the teams working within the offices. So I was very confident, if you like, to take the office approach out to the contractors and really, really work through what they're doing on site. Um, my, my first big break came, I think we were launching, it was the uh, post-tender uh, interviews. We got the contractor on site for the Ondeche Theatre, which was a big lecture theatre in, in London. Um, my principal had lost his voice, so I then got the chance to uh, present a little bit uh, without any preparation from my point of view, because I'd led the package of work with the team. I was able to talk through the specification and the drawings. Uh, I remember other times when I, I just anecdotally, you know, kind of being an architect, you're traveling around quite a lot, different cities, the countryside. We had one client who was a beautiful pool house we were designing in Sussex. And uh, she had some issues in the local courthouse with a cleaner on immigration. So it's a very, that was nearly 20 years ago. It's a very contemporary issue. Um, she abandoned me on site. Um, and I suffer from hay fever. I've taken some tablets for the day. Um, by the time she picked me up about five hours later, I was, I was pretty much hyperventilating. Um, but anyway, <laughs> some of the things you remember. Um, but getting back to the work, the, you know, as I progressed through the office, it's really about taking through the responsibility of details. So it was the petition details, looking at wall linings, and that would turn into cladding details. That would mean that I could then meet and discuss with the subcontractors and really protect the design ethos of both the client brief and what the practice was trying to achieve. And that, that's really how my kind of route had gone from being working on, on very simple things and surveys through the process of the planning illustration. So actually being much more engaged with the design, but effectively from quite a technical aspect. But that gave me a lot more confidence actually talking with uh, the specialists about how we actually get that extra few millimeters out of a, a window mullion or whatever it was going to be. Um, I think as I progressed through the next 10 years of the practice, so I'd now I've become a project architect for barely a year and a half. I was very rapidly promoted to an associate because I'd had that long run with the uh, practice from my uh, post degree work. And very soon I became a, a director. And, in that process of being an associate, you know, it was a mixture of kind of running small projects. So it would be the house extensions, the residential, the small private residential projects or packages for the larger buildings. With the smaller projects, I really got to run the whole process in terms of the, the planning application process, building control applications, you know, tendering and managing the contractor on site. Whereas for the bigger project, obviously we'd be, we have much bigger teams and you'd focus on one element of the building. Um, and that, that kind of wholesome experience brought me into into being a, a, a director. Um, but it was the range of experience that the, the practice kind of relied on me for in terms of I could quite fit, I was quite good at estimating time for delivery of, of elements of work. So I got involved in fee proposals, bid writing, and then eventually the interviews. And out of that, I became very much client facing. Um, I just thought maybe I, I should wrap up in kind of what else? Because, I mean, through that career, I've kind of seen pay cuts um, and uh, ups and downs of, of the economy. Um, we've obviously got a situation of the pandemic at the moment. But I got involved with the RIBA Council, which I, I strongly recommend people 
do get involved with the RIBA, both as a student member and afterwards. From that, I got into the education committee. That trickled down into my uh, organising events at branch level, which then trickled into me getting involved with local organisations, encouraging um, you know the, the anti-development communities, having open discussions with developer um, and, and sort of protesting groups. Um, and I've ended up actually kind of stewarding at local events, which has ended resulted in me being involved in, in master planning uh, outside festivals, which didn't happen this year, but for 20, 25,000 people. Um, this is all on my on my free time. And, and now very much I'm involved with local community groups where I end up um, negotiating land licenses and um, trying to capture the vision of the project from the community so we can uh, drive that forward in bids for grants and so on. So that, that's all happening in the background. I, I'd really sort of stress to everybody that the, you know, communication I found is really important through my progress. Um, there's no room for anybody to have a chip on their shoulder and everyone contributes in the team from the client to the specialist subcontractors. Um, and a lot of patience is required. And I think for me, the building of confidence was really important and that step-by-step -step, um, approach. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there, Karishma, and we'll come back through Q&A if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, I think it's just great to hear kind of, you know, like yourself and Dav kind of really starting from when you graduated and hearing your, you know, experiences about not finding a job and what else you did and how long it took, just kind of like showing the resilience and, and a lot of what our students are going through right now, you know, in particular class of 2020 or even all the other students who kind of, you know, in the last few months adapted to the changing ways of teaching and, you know, um, so I think that's that's really relatable and that's that's really nice to hear. And um, I'm glad it's all working out well at the moment. Um, but, you know, again, just to remind everybody, whilst you're hearing from our panel members, you know, listening about their experiences and what they've, you know, kind of been up to and the skills. Um, if you've got particular questions for them that you really, you know, like answered or, you know, you're interested in the kind of stuff they've done or are doing, um, then this is your opportunity to really, you know, ask those and hopefully we'll be able to get them answered for you today. Um, so thank you again, Chris, for that, um, for that, you know, little, you know, as much as you could summarize about, you know, your, your career and you're right. As well. And uh, we'll now go to Margaret to, to tell us a little bit about, you know, your experiences, your job role, your journey as well. Um, so, yeah, so over to you, Margaret. Thank you. Cool, thank you. So I'm Margaret. I'm an architectural, part two architectural assistant at SOM and my interest in architecture developed strongly during my A-levels. So whilst I was on a college day trip back to London on the train back um, to Nottingham from London, I happened to sit next to a director of Lena Design Architects, um, which is a practice in Nottingham. And I became instantly engaged by his architectural drawings that he had in front of our table. And I started a conversation to know more about his raw and very beautifully unrefined drawings that um, he had in front of him. So as I continued to speak, as he continued to speak about the project and his experiences with architecture, um, I could see that his love and passion for um, this, for his career, it just resonated on me. And I kind of no longer felt like a lost fish in the big ocean for wanting to become an architect. So then um, later on, whilst I was undertaking my A-levels uh, product design course, I contacted David to see whether I could design or make a 3D promotional package for his company. And this ended up being a successful collaboration, which gave me my first experience inside an architecture practice. And during the summer, I then worked as a full-time junior architectural assistant. Um, there at Lena Design and um, the year after I was able to apply my skills that I developed there as a, as I volunteered for a local um, Nottingham magazine. Um, so having applied the skills and the knowledge that I acquired had acquired so far, 
I graduated from my part one at London Metropolitan University. And then I soon started my year out experience at Learner Design Architects. And then my part two studies um, at DMU soon followed where here I felt that my ideas and my approach to architecture were extremely supported. And this accumulation of support um, mixed with my passion um, blossomed in my final thesis project called The Wild City. And parallel to my thesis, I had also accepted a job um, at DMU University as a part-time lecturer. Um, teaching the digital and analog module for um, to the first year of architecture students, as well as continuing to work part time at Learner Design Architects. So I was juggling between my practice job, um, my university job, and also my um, architecture project, which can sound quite intense. But this period of my life. Um, I also developed my time management and leadership skills. Um, later that year in my part two, I was nominated for the RIBA President's Medal for Design. And that was in 2018. And then I later that year, I won the SOM Traveling Fellowship at the President's Medal. Um, so now, following from this chapter, I started my current role at SOM last year, and then this September, I have started my part three at Westminster. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that, Margaret. I think it's really nice to hear that kind of sat on a bus and got inspired by, um, you know, someone kind of gave you that, and hopefully, you know, some of us, some viewers that are watching us today are probably looking to come to DMU and, you know, might just get inspired by, by this live stream <laughs> or from you know, hearing from, from you and, and from, you know, all our panel members and um, you might, you know, so it's about, and some of the skills that you've mentioned as well, time management and that kind of stuff, it's, it's so um, relevant with a lot of stuff going on right now with, you know, whether it's leadership skills or adapting to different things, volunteering and all of that. So I'm sure anyone who's listening to us now um, will, will, will kind of you know, engage and relate with, with those as well. So thank you um, for that. And I'm sure we'll get some questions in later specifically to maybe know more about, about what you're doing. So, um, okay. And um, last but not the least, um, Laura, if you would like to again you know tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now your experiences your journey as well and um, yeah so i will let you take it and over to you laura thanks karishma um yeah so i took a slightly different career path to the other members of the panel um i started my degree at dmu and um, graduated in 2008 and I started working in practice um, and then went on to do my part two. So kind of all quite normal for an architect, went down that route. Um, I actually did my part two at somewhere called uh, the Centre for Alternative Technology. Um, and I was kind of in the second group of students to go through that. So it was quite a, a new, very different course, all based on building and sustainability. Um, and I kind of came out of that kind of thinking, oh, what am I going to do? Because I was working in a practice um, and I didn't really feel, necessarily feel that sustainability was the top of the agenda, either at that practice or at many that I was applying for at that time. I mean, this was 10 years ago now, so it's quite diff it was quite different. Um, and I kind of was a bit lost, didn't really know what to do. And I saw um, uh, an internship come up at the Architects Journal that was focused on sustainability. And I thought, oh, that looks kind of interesting. I'll go see that, I'll do, do that, I'll see what's going on. Um, and I got the internship um, and I moved to London for four months um, and did that. And then I kind of went back to my practice um, and kind of just carried on as if I hadn't even been there <laughs> to the AJ and kind of just carried on, went to my part three. Um, and then a, a kind of year, two years later, uh, the AJ got in touch and they said, oh, we've got this job. Um, do you want to come and join us? And so that was it. I left practice um, and kind of ended up on a completely different career path to what I kind of expected. I always thought I was going to be an architect and that was it. And that, that was sorted. 
Um, so it was quite, yeah, quite different. So I ended up at the AJ uh, and I kind of worked my way up through there, through different roles. So I started off as a technical reporter, kind of using all those skills that I'd built up in practice um, about kind of how we build all the regulations, all the planning, all the sustainability stuff. Um, and then I kind of just went through different roles at the AJ. I kind of became a digital editor. So I started running the website, all the social media, all of that. Um, and then uh, I kind of, I got a job as the architecture editor. Um, so that was looking after all of the content, deciding what buildings went in, uh, into the magazine and kind of what we covered. Um, and I became their uh, main building critic. Uh, and it was a really amazing, challenging job, you know, it's like working to a very tight deadline, which you kind of learn about at university and then you kind of, and then they're taken to another level and you have to produce stories every single day and a magazine every week. Um, and I, I kind of reached a point where I was like, this is great. It's really, like, I love it. I'm getting to travel. I'm seeing all these buildings, but what next? Um, so I left the AJ and I took a job at the Royal Academy of Arts, which is um, a big art gallery in London. Um, and I, they had quite a small architecture department. So I went to work in their architecture department, looking at different architecture projects. So um, the kind of main thing I did was developing an awards system, which was kind of bringing international architects over to the UK. Um, and kind of introducing them to the UK audience through this kind of little award system. Um, and I launched a, an architecture magazine um, within the Royal Academy. And then, so like things kind of changed. I was there for a couple of years. And then this job came up um, at this place called Walmer Yard. I thought, oh, it's really interesting. So Walmer Yard, for those of you, most of you probably won't know, uh, is a housing scheme in London. Uh, developed by an architect called Peter Salter, who kind of, this is his only scheme in the UK. Um, his other work is all, is in Japan and he's mainly known for his teaching. So I took up this um, job here as a, as almost like a curator. So um, I run the housing scheme as a, as a museum space almost, um, or a research space. The idea is that we keep the houses open so people can visit them and can learn about architecture. But the main focus of the um, foundation that I run here is all about um, how we experience architecture. So I do lots of um, programming, working with kind of musicians, artists, um, yeah, like lots of people about how we use the spaces. So we've done kind of talks in beds. Um, we've done uh, sound baths in the basement. We've, um, yeah, we've, uh, we had Bartlett students do an installation here last year. So it's been really varied. Um, and because I'm, I'm kind of running the place, I get to make all the decisions and think, of, and it's really creative because I come up with the program and what we do. Um, and it's been great. Um, and then, so alongside that, I also teach. So I teach at the Bartlett School of Architecture and at Greenwich. And it's really nice to kind of give back um, and to kind of see students making those kind of decisions that I was making like 10, 15 years ago, a long time ago. Um, and it's great to kind of support them. But I'm a big believer in having a side hustle, I would say. And so on the side, I also um, make uh, films. Uh, whilst I was at the AJ, I kind of started working with a photographer called Jim Stevenson. And when we were there, we started doing a few move, like smaller kind of films and things. And and then when I left, we were like, oh, it'd be quite good to still work together. You know, we started this here. Let's carry on. Um, so we've carried on making a, a series of films. And that's a little thing that I do just to keep things interesting outside of work. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Um, I love the, you know, advice on the side hustle. I think, yeah, you know, uh, keeps things interesting. And, uh, you know, I suppose for some, for some cases, you know, just not let things get boring and you've got lots of other things going on as well. But it's really nice, um, at least I'm sure from um, the perspective of many, you know, people who may be watching that, you know, you've kind of did your degree and your part one, part two, and then kind of diversified into, into different things. So anyone who's got questions, you know, you've just graduated or you're kind of going through your 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 degree or you're about to join you know 
um, I'm sure Laura would be able to answer some questions that you may have regarding, you know, what else could you be doing, um, you know, help you think about those things if you haven't already. Um, so just to remind everybody, please send in your questions for our panel members, um, you know, about, you know, anything you've heard already, or if there's anything, you know, you really want to know about, you know, um, whatever situation you're in now in terms of whether you've just graduated, looking at jobs, you know, you want some experience, advice, tips, and kind of, you know, some motivations or inspiration as well. So I'm sure they'll be happy to share that with you. And also just to remind everybody as well, obviously, to head over to our um, Instagram page for DMU Degree Show, which launched earlier today at 12 o'clock. Um, currently, there's a lot of architecture work going on from a class of 2020. So we're really thrilled to be showcasing uh, their work, you know, which is part of these and the Q&A live streams are a part of our Art and Design Degree Show. So I think what this might be a good opportunity to kind of go into some Q and A's and um, you know kind of take it from there and hopefully as well then we'll get some other questions coming in and it'll just it'll just roll from there. Okay, so I think if we go to our first question, we'll start nice and easy and uh, we'll go with what do you love about your job? Seeing that we've kind of heard everyone talk about you know what they're doing and stuff like that and. Maybe if someone's looking to go into the kind of job you're into to hear what are the kind of maybe some highlights and, and what you love about what you're doing right now. Um, we'll start with Chris, shall we? Uh, Chris, I'll, I'll let you go first. Thanks, Krishma. Well, I, I think what I love most actually is is people meeting different people. And I, and I suppose what that really means in architecture is that it, I'm always amazed and perplexed how things actually get built, and actually, it's quite breathtaking when you when you see at the end something built, whether it's a a, a toilet refurbishment or a cladding installation or or a new building in a new development. Uh, all of that goes through a number of people from the very first moment you you meet the the, the client to the consultant team to all the regulations to go through, and then explaining it through the layers of the contractor um, that you know we don't just want necessarily the most standard product but there's a design intent behind here uh, I, yeah I, I think it all comes down to people for me thanks thank you Chris that was a uh, yeah people I think that's quite an important uh, thing to love about your job because we don't work in isolation and we do have to um, work with other people so I'll take that that's good advice for me as well so <laughs> and um, okay so maybe I'll ask the same question um, to Margaret as well in terms of you know your job what do you love most about about your job um <laughs> Yeah, what I love most, I think um, at SOM, most of the projects progress through having a strong narrative, which I really love. Um, I also feel that I'm encouraged to participate in projects and exercise my ideas and creativity. And I feel as well that I can grow in my career. I think that's what I value so far most. Thank you. Um, just to remind everyone as well, if there's anything you're hearing from our panel members and you've got a follow up question from what they've uh, what they've said, then again, please leave your question for us in the chat function and we will try our best in getting to it as well. Um, OK, so, Dav, let's ask you, what do you love about your job? I know it's quite difficult sometimes when you've done so much and, you know, it's quite hard to pinpoint. But, you know, what are some of the highlights you would say um, about about what you do? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say very similar to Chris because I think what I enjoy the most is working with talented, like-minded people and in an environment and culture that is passionate about learning and exploring ideas. So for me, it, it's me taking my enjoyment seriously and therefore it's not a job, um, but, but, but a sort of a, a, a serious hobby that I, that, that I enjoy doing. And, and also... There's not many professions or opportunities out there where you can mix art, science, problem solving, impact on uh, you know society, environment, storytelling. You know where the skills of being artistic, technical, communicative, all these sort of you know these, these sort of ingredients coming together. There's not there's not many other other opportunities or professions that that allows allows you to to, to, to do that. And it's also it's also a rewarding journey and sometimes the journey is 
actually more exciting and rewarding than the actual than the actual final completion. So, you know, I never get out of bed thinking that I'm going to do a job. And I think that's what keeps keeps my uh, keeps me that's going. That's great to hear. Thank you. And um, yeah, like minded, passionate people. You're right. Um, quite similar to what kind of Chris has said, isn't it? It's it's about the kind of people you work with and and that yeah. as well. So no, that's great. And uh, Laura, I know you you mentioned a lot about you know what different things you do and what you kind of love about them. But is there anything else you would like to add in particular? Maybe not just you know with what you're doing right now, but with all the various things that you've done, perhaps what what you've loved about them? Because if someone wants to do a bit of everything, then uh, they, I guess, you know, they've got their answer. <laughs> sure, I think the thing I love most about my current job as keeper at Warmer Yard is um, getting to spend so much time in one building. Um, it's I think it's really rare for, especially for a curator or for anyone to spend so much time in, like within a work of art or within a work of architecture. Um, and I kind of, I see the light changing. I see kind of how the building reacts to seasons, how it reacts to different uses, to different people. Um, and I kind of feel like I've got a really kind of intimate knowledge of this building, which I wouldn't have had in any other job. I think you're still muted, I can't hear you. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Yep, that's it. <laughs> that's expected. Uh, but thank you for that. Um, so, yeah, so if anyone who's listening to us right now, if there's any, again, follow up questions from what you've heard about what panel members love about their job, you know, do ask if you want to know a little bit more about about what they do. And um, OK, so I think it's we can go to our second question, which um, will we'll kind of raise the bar slightly now. So what's the best career decision? you've ever made so this might uh, get you thinking slightly um chris i'll i'll start with you first if that's all right uh, give everyone else a chance to kind of think about their answer in the meanwhile if they want to um so yeah chris what's the best career maybe not the one you've made maybe a few but yeah what would you say is one of the best decisions you've made in your career thanks chris well i you know what? I think actually staying with the practice. I mean, through all the the time that the practice has grown and then shrunk again and grown again, um, and you know, pay cuts and all the rest of it that comes along with life. But it, you know, staying with the practice for twenty three years, like I have, is you, you become part of the of the family. But it's also given me the opportunity through a number of roles, um, quite early on, getting in, involved with helping the the kind of younger staff come through so it's not quite a tutoring role but a mentoring role you know when, when i was at university i was yeah i was i was a good i was a very good student but i was i was relatively shy and i, and I think you know i always kind of looked at the endeavor in terms of research and determination and what i, I really like doing is just bringing that out and, and, and getting that confidence to grow in, in the in the next generation coming through because there's there's so much to take on board and actually just listening to people asking questions and, and writing briefs, just trying to understand which which question they're asking and what, what are they actually saying. It, it's, a, it's a minefield out there. But, um, but yeah, I think the, the best career decision, definitely stay, staying where I am. That's good to know. And also, I suppose it's kind of not giving up, isn't it? Um, from when you'd mentioned earlier, you know, when you were trying to, you went a few months looking for your first job, sends hundreds of CVs out and stuff. And I think uh, that's a, that's a, you know, good news story in itself and just kind of, you know, powering through and, and seeing light at the end of the tunnel. So, um, but no, thank you for that. Um, Lord, I'm sorry, Maggie, in terms of um, best career decision you've made is there anything so far that you'd like to you know in, in what you've done you'd like to chip in on that as well Ooh, you're on mute there um yeah sure i think being curious um and just genuinely networking has been um some of the best decisions i've made asking a question even if the question may sound stupid i think that's also <laughs> a good decision that um i've made because you know not everyone is born knowing everything and there's always a good chance that someone else is thinking the same thing 
So I'd say just being curious and um, yeah, networking as well. Great, thank you for that. And um, Laura, with the with with you know the side hustles and everything else you've got going on, and you know from when you started and stuff, what would you say is is has been your best career decision so far that you know you could perhaps share with people watching us right now? Sure, I think without a doubt it's um, taking the internship uh, back years and years ago when I decided to take four months out of my practice and do that. Um, it was kind of a huge, huge decision to make. It was unpaid. Uh, it meant leaving Leicester and moving to London. Um, and I ended up kind of, yeah, starting basically like living on friends' floors, um, kind of living, eating canapes for dinner because that's all, like I had no money to <laughs> buy food. And, um, and it was kind of a really, really crazy, crazy time. But if I hadn't have done that, there was no way I would have made the connections that I made to, to kind of further my career or, or to meet the people um, and to, to get the job, the, the kind of next job at the AJ. Um, and without, without that, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. No, thank you. That's great um, advice and tips and hearing about what you all kind of love about your jobs, the best decisions you've made. Um, so thank you for sharing that. OK, so um, let's go to our third question. Just to remind everybody, obviously, please send in your questions so we can go with answering them. We've got about, you know, just under 20 minutes left of the live stream. So, OK, this one seems about work-life balance. They're quite a good one. Something I think, you know, we, I, could, I could probably learn from a little bit as well. Um, so I think it's so important to manage a work-life balance. How do you spend your free time to de-stress? All right, I better get my notes out as well. Um, so maybe I'll start with Dav first. Talk about uh, a bit about your work-life balance. God, um, this is always a question that gets asked about when I'm, when I'm with friends and family who have you know, as like I said, diff different careers and, and jobs. And I, I guess it's going back to my sort of previous response that I sort of take, I, I don't take my career as a sort of a, as a job where I need to distress from. And therefore my experience has been, I've, I've never really had to look for that work-life balance because I'm doing something that I enjoy. And if I enjoy designing, if I enjoy, you know, resolving problems and, 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 and being creative, then actually part of my hobby is to continue to do that. Um, so I, my, my life has been such that my, my sort of work life has been quite blurred. I, I, you know, I distress myself by, by sort of designing and I, and I work by designing. So for me, it's, it's a sort of one life and one hobby. Great. So I think you're right in saying the kind of biggest takeaway is love what you do. you you know, and then it doesn't, it doesn't feel like work then. <laughs> no, no. no. No, that's good to know. Okay, Chris, work-life balance. What could, uh, you know, how's, how's your work-life balance, if you could say a little bit about that, and what do you do to de-stress? Thanks. Well, I think under COVID-19, it's kind of, the work-life balance has been turned on its head a little bit because it's working from home. There's very much more grey gray areas. But you know what? The most daunting thing, I think, in, in my career was was having – children and I'm saying that as a, as a man because my, my wife's also an architect and I think just knowing you're know, switching from working quite long hours um, to then having to think about pickups from nursery kind of spending quality time with the, with the children and so on but also that that gives a real kind of breath of fresh air and actually you know I, I, do, I do a lot of cycling to and from work when, when we're going into the office that that time is a, is a decompression time you, you grab it where you can but you know there'll be sometimes at 9 30 10 o'clock at night i'll be thinking about that you know change of a design or change of a detail or perhaps who i should phone the next day so it, it it's with you all the time and I, and I think you know that's that's really important but as i mentioned in my summary the last sort of 10 years particularly a lot of a lot of community activity has been quite important for me just getting involved with the local neighbours and, and, you know, perhaps sharing some of my skills, but just actually learning quite a lot from other people has been re really, really interesting. So uh, all of these things, you know, they're, they're all tools to decompress and, and, and just take your mind off, off things. 
Thank you. I think at times, you know, like this with with what we're going through, this is it's much more um, important to de-stress. And it's it's interesting hearing, you know, from your take that it's, it's stepping away not from architectural stuff and just doing other stuff like whether it's cycling or community work. And, you know, that is that can be really fulfilling as well. So thank you for that. And I'm sure, you know, that will be great advice for anyone uh, listening in. Um, Laura, is there anything that you would like to kind of, I'm very interested in your work-life balance, Laura, <laughs> um, you know, so it'd be interesting to, yeah, get your take on it as well. Yeah, um, I think I literally have no work-life balance at all, um, and I don't think it's important. Um, I think if you kind of really love architecture and you really love what you're doing, that is what should matter, um, and so you kind of, like, I choose to go and visit buildings in my spare time and that's what I really love um, and that's what I really, really enjoy. Uh, I go to art galleries, you know, I spend, that's what I do. Um, and I think if like you're really passionate about architecture, uh, the fact that you want to do it in your spare time is kind of what makes it interesting. Um, I guess the pandemic has also, you know, changed everyone's work-life balance. Um, I've moved into one we yard, so there is really no difference between work and home. I don't leave, I just, I'm here. Um, and that's definitely changed things slightly. Sometimes good to get out of the house and go somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I think architecture is about really loving it. I think you can only really do it if you really care. That's good to know. So quite similar to kind of what Dav said about, you know, being passionate about about what you do and then it doesn't feel like work and it's something that you you thoroughly enjoy doing. So, no, thank you. Um, again, just to remind everybody, um, please send in your comments and questions. We've got about um, less than 10 minutes remaining of the live stream. So really want to use this opportunity to answer your questions. Um, I think we'll go to our next question um, in this um, to move on with. So, OK. How was the transition from part one graduate to working in practice? I think that's a really good question. Um, and perhaps we'll start with um, Margaret, if you could answer that. I think a lot of our, you know, 20, class of 2020 are probably in this um, in this position right now. So it'd be nice to get your take on it. Yeah. Um, from what I remember, it was, they're like two different worlds in a, <laughs> in a way. Um, I found that I learned quite a lot um, about architecture and the practice um, in general um, in in the practice um, and in uni I felt like I was able it was like a trial and error kind of stage where I could come up with these wacky designs and um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I just realised I was mute there for a second. Um, Laura, from your kind of experience of uh, part one, part two, um, anything you'd like to say? What was the transition like? Um, I found it quite easy uh, transitioning from um, university through to practice. Uh, but I think it was really helped by the fact that I'd worked in different places. So every time we had a you know a summer break or a summer holiday, I would find a different practice to work in. Um, and so it gave me a real insight into different architecture practices uh, and I kind of got an idea of where when it came to doing my year out where I might want to go um, and I think it's really useful because then when you're coming to your first kind of year out it's not the first time you've ever gone into practice um, and because I think that could be a bit daunting um, but I think the big thing is like always remember like the practice don't see you as coming knowing everything they see you as kind of this like fresh meat that um, and so like you it's okay to ask questions it's okay to not know um, and I think you'll get more out of it if you the more questions you ask great thank you so much for that hopefully that's answered your question um, Hashim so okay let's move on to um, our next question which is about okay so I'm currently pursuing second year of masters in architecture um, it'll be a bit challenging I would like to hear about the motivation that will keep me up to date in my studies oh nice question as well indeed um, Chris 
advice to students to stay motivated through their studies. What would you say on that? Wow, that, that's that's quite a question. I I think you know the the thing to remember about all of this, no matter pandemic or or anything. Um, as, as Laura said, when, when you when you come out from one zone to another, when you arrive in the workplace, you're kind of fresh meat, whatever happens anyway. Um, it's the one opportunity you've got to still really experiment and, and explore things and research things in a way. I think everything you do in your studies actually sets you in train for how you're going to progress through your career. Obviously, you get chances to refine and enhance that, potentially pivot on that, if you if you want to use that sort of term. But actually, the, the building blocks of what you're doing now and the opportunities, you, you as much as you can broaden your awareness, um, and, and try not to be to have too much tunnel vision. Um, you know, the, the tutors, and I hope I don't offend any old tutors of mine here, but, you know, the tutors will have their own their own view of what your work is and the grades they want to give you uh, and so on. But it really is, you've, you've got to be true to yourself. And I think use that to kind of position yourself as to what you want to, to do in the future, because the biggest project you're going to have is your, your career, actually, and how that, how that, what that trajectory is and you know different approaches I've, I've kind of stayed with one practice um more traditionally people would, would would change jobs more frequently so i think keep keep with it and keep keep your eyes open thanks great thank you that's good good advice um okay and um dav what would be your take on that well how can they stay motivated I think you're on mute there, Dav. Here you go. I think I would pick up on what Laura said earlier about, about architecture. I think I think if, if you've made that decision that you want to study architecture, um, it's not something that will just finish when your studies finish. It's it's a lifetime, it's it's a lifetime sort of uh, commitment. Um, and I and and I think the the way to sort of keep the motivation going is to be inspired, um, is to be influenced. Is to experience and 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 sort of uh, and when I mean experience, experience spaces, experience buildings. So the one way to do it, and you know, I still do it even even where I am now, is to go and visit buildings, go and visit places. Um, and that doesn't mean to go far away. It may mean down to your local high street, it may mean down to the next town. You know, just to go around and experience uh, uh, experience experience environment in a way that sort of makes you think about why does this work. In a certain way, why do spaces change during the sort of uh, uh, during seasons? Why does it change during the day? This is all about building up knowledge and experience because it's those it's those sort of moments that will influence your decisions as you as you sort of as you progress with with projects of your own. And I think it's important that um, it's not just about opening books and reading and, and reading. And that's a great thing about architecture again. Is, is it's it's as, as practical as it is uh, as it is as it is in terms of theory. So you have the opportunity to broaden your horizons and and go and visit places as well as as well as as well as you know test ideas. That so don't don't sort of um, don't feel like you're sort of stuck in a in a in a certain way. You, you can you can you can navigate your studying in a way that you want to. That's great. It's about, I guess, being inquisitive and kind of, um, you know, outside of the classroom and seeing what else is going on as well, isn't it? So I think a lot of people hearing or watching from whichever year they're studying in now, whether coming to university or, you know, first, second or third, yeah. that, that's, that's applicable to all of them. Yeah. Um, OK. I mean, it's, it's just so interesting when you work on projects now. I'm sure Chris and um, Laura probably and, and, you know, do the same as that. When you talk about projects, it's amazing how when you get around people, how much you talk about your experiences and about you know redesigning homes you talk a lot about your homes you're talking about workspace you talk about your own workspace so experience and, and gathering that those experiences are really important for for your career great thank you i think this is a really good question and i'd like to uh, bring in uh, margaret and laura on this as well so maybe i'll ask laura first in terms of you know staying motivated um for this through while studying because i think it's so relevant for you know whoever's watching us right now so yeah, anything you'd like to say on that, Laura? 
Sure. I think for me, to what I do to help motivate myself is always to like hear from other architects. Like I love to uh, go to lectures or um, kind of see other architects talking about their work. Um, I feel it's like really interesting. And even if they're not just talking about their work, talking about their ideas or what motivates them. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to be harder to do that now. You know, all of the organisations that were running talks and things aren't doing them, but they're they're still kind of happening. You know, the, the best thing I think I would recommend to you all is like go and look at the Architecture Foundation's 100 Day Studio, which is all online on YouTube. And there's like hundreds of lectures and talks that you can watch. And um, and I kind of watched a lot of those live during lockdown and they were so kind of motivating just to hear different voices on, on those. So um, I think just like feeding your brain, like with other stuff, because it all kind of help with all your projects and everything you do. It's like, and don't just read about architecture, you know, um, feed it with like other things that then might come in, like other designers, other like fashion, uh, furniture design, everything, because it'll all feed into what you're doing. Thank you, Laura. And uh, Margaret, I'd like to get your take on, on that as well. Um, what can they do to stay motivated um, during their studies? Yeah, um, I agree with what the rest of the panel have said I think um, as well architecture school can be intense and it's okay if you right now you don't know what kind of architect you want to be I think um, just have a passion and have in mind that it's not it's not always about change in the world but rather contributing to a better world and I think just keeping an open mind through the good days and the bad days Great, thank you so much. Um, I think this is a nice question to end on and it's kind of brought us right straight to the hour. And um, I'd just like to say, you know, thank you to our panel and for everyone who's, you know, watched us or, you know, listening to us live or whether later. And I really hope hearing from our industry panel has helped you in, in some way. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for the time to the um, our panelists who've been here with us and for you all just watching us right now. Um, finally, I'd just like to say, don't forget to head over to our Instagram page, which is DMU Degree Show, um, showcasing and highlighting some spectacular work from across our, you know, art, design, architecture, fashion and textile courses um, from class of 2020. Usually we'd be hosting this event on campus, uh, but, you know, we've, we've uh, done the virtual showcase for this. And um, also on our Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we also have other live streams taking place at 2 p.m. again. So please do join us with other uh, panel members to hear about their experiences as well. Um, so thank you again to everyone watching and our panel members um, for this for this afternoon and this live stream. So yeah, so thank you all. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.